636, it's December 23rd. This is the Fiber Broadband Completion Task Force uh, meeting. And my name is Mark Howell, the chairperson, and I'm calling the meeting to order with a roll call vote. Um, Gordon Brockway. Present. Uh, actually not a vote, just, just checking who's here. Scott Hopkinson. Here. Um, David Hessel. Here. Um, and I do not see Gail Heyer yet. Um, and I, I'll note that uh, Carlin Reed is also join, joining us on Zoom. Uh, we're holding this meeting under the existing authorization from the state of Massachusetts for remote and virtual meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, um, so that'll serve as our call to order. Uh, can I have a volunteer to clerk for tonight's meeting? So I'll, I'll do it because I now know that I have to do it during the meeting and send it instead of like October 7th, which just went out, send it immediately. Okay. So if you want, sure. I'll do it. Unless someone else wants to do it, I'm, I'm, I'll am i be doing it. I'll be happy to do it. Thank you, Scott. Okay, I appreciate that. And as Scott just mentioned um, in your email, just within the last half hour or so are the October 7th meeting minutes, which are, um, have been uh, distributed now. So uh, I know that no one's probably had a time. I know I haven't had a chance to look them over. So um, we'll plan to handle them um, at our next meeting. And we'll talk about when that's going to be in just a minute. Um, and David, you, you were clerk last. Yes, um, actually going to um, take what I notes that I took and then go to the video and clean them up once I watch the video. Okay, great. And um, if you have, if you are able to distribute them before the next meeting, that's fine. Um, that'd be great. By the um, way, let me just make a recommendation. When you, if it's on YouTube, you can play, run the playback at 1.75 and it's perfectly understandable. Oh, good, and thanks. It's a very yeah, useful I thing. <laughs> yeah, it takes a, how to, how to turn an hour and a half into an hour. Right. Yeah, very good. Okay, um, so just from a chair's report perspective, um, I will note, and I was, Gordon, I was going to ask you if you could double check the time, but CMLP, I believe, has a, uh, the light board has a budget meeting scheduled um, next week, Wednesday the 29th. They do not have, did not have that posted when I last checked when I wrote this agenda. Um, but are, is that meeting? It's at two o'clock. Okay. And just see if I could uh, pull it up. Yeah, the purpose of that meeting, of course, is, is to um, present and, and review the um, budgets for the enterprise for um, fiscal 2022, which for the light plant is, is a January through December, um, same as calendar year. So for those members that can make that, that would be an opportunity to look at what the current financial plan is for uh, broadband, assuming they have that meeting. Yeah, I'd be interested yeah, to know about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's two o'clock on December 29th. Right, okay, good to know. Yeah, I, I was looking for that to be posted, but um, anybody that has time and it'd be interesting to see the materials and you know as for, as far as future topics go i think um you know revisiting the the broadband financials for um for the next year could be could be useful for us to do and it'd be nice to start with that um uh, that document having said that uh the next thing I wanted to, to go over quickly was uh, future meeting dates. We could uh, meet next Thursday, the 30th, which is, uh, you know, sort of the, well, I guess it's second to last business day of the year, but possibly the last day. Tomorrow, town offices are closed, and I believe they may be closed 
next week too, next Friday as well. Um, or, so the, this is a sense of the meeting, or the first, the next meeting, we, we could skip the holiday week. I didn't know what people's availability was. And that would put us on um, Thursday, January 6th. I'm good for other dates. Okay. Likewise for me. I'm, I'm okay to keep plugging away. Yeah. Gordon, are you all right? Either date. Okay. So I'm going to, let's, let's see how we, but let's assume that we will meet on, on um, both of those dates. Then um, the, oh, I see I have a typo in the agenda. I meant to say the, the 13th of January is a Thursday as well. And then the Thursday, the 20th is the date that's currently or is scheduled for the special town meeting um, for the middle school reconstruction project. So we'd noted that earlier in our discussions. And so it would be my intention to skip that week and not meet on that on that day so that everyone can, uh, can go to town meeting and consider that important. So, so did you say we're gonna meet on the 6th of January? Yeah, let's, 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 let's actually plan on meeting on the 30th and on the 6th. So if that, so it'd be nice to kind of get back to, to once a week. And then the 13th is available to us. We would not meet on the 20th. And then the, the final meeting for January would be the 27th. So we'd get three meetings in January. I'm uh, out of town from the 27th to the 4th. Oh, but okay. So then the 30th is not a good day for you. Uh, no. This is the 27th of January. Oh, 27th of January. Okay, good to know. I thought you were moving into deep into January when you said the Yeah, he was. was. He was, yeah. So I was, and then-, then Got to be explicit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> By the way, is my typing too loud as I'm typing and leaving my mic no. open? Okay. No, it's fine. Okay. It's the advantage of a headset. Yeah. So are we still doing uh, the 27th or you want to move it? So uh, we'll, I think we'll cross that bridge when we get a little bit closer, but it's okay. good to know that, that David's not available then. And um, of course we don't have Gail here at the moment, so we're not quite a hundred percent, but I'll serve um, back. Just to put it in context, when when we have to have our report done? Just out of curiosity. Well, that's gonna be the primary streaming. subject of today's meeting, but I think okay. we, we're, tar we're targeting, um, completing a report with, you know, and really I'd say trying to wrap up the primary mission of this committee uh, by the time the annual town meeting occurs, which I believe is May 1st, something like that. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but it's May. So uh, yeah. we're going to begin to think about how to complete, what, what work needs to be completed and how to complete it. I think that we're going to need to have some cycle of presentations and discussions with, you know, with appropriate boards, uh, as well as as really sort of plumb how we're how are we going to reach the, whatever positions we we think we need to reach. Um, so I'm trying to move us into a direction of having a work plan for this, at least in, in broad steps. And that was kind of the purpose of, of coming up with this, you know, preliminary. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I just, I just wanted to keep an eye on the end date there. Yeah, you know, I think it's, there. there's, well, well, we'll get into that in a few minutes, but I think there's, I'm trying to leave, leave room for us to define what, what the work product is. And then as we talked about in, in some of our earlier discussions, if there are things that we don't think that we can get done, but might need to be done, then we could make some recommendations in the direction of some follow-on work for somebody as well as I think a considerable amount of what we're likely to land on is going to be recommendations for things that should be done in the normal course of, of, of 
operating this business. So yeah, and I think from the very beginning, just to re re remind folks, we did discuss this notion that we might one of our recommendations that that this work and this committee be extended for some mm -hmm. period of time. Yeah, you know, it was in the constructs of Article Forty One, perhaps you know, with the value of what they see coming out of us, maybe it's worth keeping going, maybe at a slightly lower pace, frankly. Uh, yeah. But uh, I do think there's, to me, there's there's good work coming out of here. So and we've gotten Great. that from, we've gotten that from our, you know, from mm -hmm. outside people as well, so. Yeah, so before we get, you know, jump off into that discussion, which, I, which I'm which i definitely itching to have, um, is there anything that anyone was um, expecting they felt they needed. I just put in this task force old business item on the on the agenda for if anyone either felt like they they had a follow up or 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 something that that needed to be addressed from from a prior meeting. Um, this would be the the time to talk about that. Could it, could I just confirm we're not meeting on December 29th, right? We're meeting on December 30th. We're, we're going to meet on December 30th, yes. And I just was calling attention to the light board meeting on the 29th for those that want to attend it to get a look at the broadband budget for 2022. Thank you. Okay. Um, to um, your earlier, to the, to the question I interrupted you with, um, I just wanted to, tell you that I, I thought of uh, a scenario for um, providing service to the um, borderline streets that are under that are not served. Mm -hmm. And um, it really, it's a specific question and it requires looking at the specifics of how you'd actually access that area. We think that perhaps um, uh, Con Concord Muse is accessible through um, Concord own, uh, Municipal light plant owned land. But just generally, just opening up the topic a little bit, not that we need to discuss it in detail, but sure, Eversource serves some of these streets. Mm -hmm. um, but if we could find a path in there, the path mm -hmm. doesn't actually have to follow necessarily, or it doesn't have to fall within the boundaries of, of Concord. And what you could do is you could actually offer a service to the connecting streets to get to the Concord Street. And this, an example that it's a little bit like the water service uh, being offered on, um, on Great Road in Acton. Like on those houses, those buildings get water from Concord because that's on the way. Yeah. So kind of a similar notion. And that would be the first step towards exploring the idea of, or it's related to the idea of, of uh, offering service outside of our boundaries. Yeah. But yeah. I, it's kind of a minor point, but it falls and it falls into the just general category of how do we get to those remaining streets? Mm -hmm. I think those are both two interesting examples. I mean, when one of the projects that's on the town capital plan that often gets relatively, you know, not not as much mentioned as something like a school is the. I think it's twenty-eight million dollar water treatment facility that's that's being built on the shores of Naga Pond by the water department, and of course there is a right of way that's owned by the water department that goes all the way from Concord to to Naga Pond to for the purposes of bringing water up there, and we have gone through some machinations and have some what I would call suboptimal networking capabilities to those very important pieces of infrastructure. There's a pumping station along the way as well as as well as the water treatment facility itself. And it's all because you know we've never actually tried to run our fiber all the way out there. So you know that that is it falls in the broad range of, of potential potential areas that could be somewhat easy to serve and might pay for themselves. I think how to think about that is, is an important element that we should at least point to the need to analyze. Yeah. If, you, you know, or, and it kind of, so, and another example is, you know, we have an existing fiber connection that goes all the way 
to Carlisle Center, connects to their police and fire department that supports radio transmission and things like that. And um, considering the, the you know, close relationship between our two communities and the fact that the fiber networks are literally already connected to each other, you know, it kind of begs the question of what services, you know, could or should be delivered there, especially if they can be delivered cost effectively. And I think that's, that's, you know, that, that, that is a very, you know, how to, how to, how to analyze what can be done and what's, what the, um, you know, financial hurdles or, or cha challenges are that are put in place to, you know, before the, the electric, the broadband utility goes into, into a particular purpose and, and what purposes they are, I think are very important strategic questions and policy questions that need to be asked and answered. Um, so. I, I just have one question, Mark, and I, I heard this second hand. I gather that there was a meeting on the middle school construction and the question was asked about broadband going mm -hmm. into the middle school and it was rejected quite out of hand and it won't go there. I the didn't hear that question. By the superintendent. For, for, from the, yeah. So here- I'm not that we're policymakers, but you know, I was intrigued by that. No, we're going to do Wi-Fi or whatever. Oh, 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 Gail's question. She she actually asked this question at the meeting, and what she asked about was the use of Ethernet versus versus wireless for student workstations and, and in classrooms. Right. Okay. So that's different. That's the that's the, different. Okay. The inside the building networking if you will okay and what you know what kind of infrastructure they're doing for that because the the um the fact is that all of the school buildings existing and future are already on the fiber network okay and the the light plant um leases and maintains capacity basically dark fiber capacity to the school department and they use that to interconnect all the all the buildings um and actually you know they get a bargain i mean they they have virtually unlimited capacity essentially for the cost of of the light plan agreeing to keep the fiber you know strung if if it were so, it's a you know very much a you know what I would say you know, and I'm not I don't want to characterize it one way or the other, but you know I would take it as this is a network that's owned by the town and the town is using it for itself in that in that regard. Even though yeah. we have all these different legal entities, the reality is that it's Concord's network and it's being used for Concord School Department. I for one am perfectly okay with that okay. I think, so yeah. it's interesting mark so rather than being a subscriber to the broadband they just lease dark fiber and do their own thing do they actually reach into the internet peering side as well or do they get their bandwidth through conquer broadband they they did at one point and then they dropped it it was it was difficult as they as they moved more and more services to the cloud they they were kind of ahead of the, you know, I would say the ability of Concord Broadband to, to provide services. So yep. we've often talked about, you know, who's a customer of Concord Broadband. And it turns out that it's a it's an appropriate service for for residential consumers and, and small businesses, but it doesn't offer all of the services of a of a even a regional ISP. And um, so right. the school yeah. department has has you know become it's very dependent on on broadband and needed to be um, dual connected and and it, although again the the dark fiber is used to to assist in some of that connection if I remember right. Yeah, interesting. Um, just so yeah, they they probably want things like fixed IP addresses and other stuff that are kind of a pain for us to deal yeah, with. Yeah, anyway. BGP services. As oh, well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, do we? 
do we happen to know how, for example, of a large campus over at Concord Academy deals with their broadband or? Um, they, I would... they, they are amongst the private schools that are customers for, for the, several of the private schools in town are customers of Concord Light Broadband. So they fit into that enterprise and, and custom bid services. And they buy they buy one pipe with perhaps a gigabit of bandwidth for hundreds of users. Is that true? Um, yeah, and they they also also have some private networking done. So you know, if you remember a few years ago, they built a facility out where Arena Farms used to be. Yeah, yeah. Along, so they needed a way to connect to that, and so Concord Broadband provides them with the ability to connect that satellite campus in effect to the main campus on a private network, which is exactly the kind of thing that, you know, it's, it's perfect for an, for an enterprise that has multiple locations that all happen to be inside Concord. There's, there are several businesses that, that run that way. Okay. And it's, it's, you know, it's again, um, available to these, to these local institutions at rates that are uh, quite attractive, I think, relative to what, you know, larger commercial telcos charge and, and when the service needs are, are a match, it's a very, you know, very helpful thing, I think, to be able to do. I, I, I want to tease at this just a few more minutes. Um, mm. They have, a, I, I'm trying to look it up as we're talking, uh, the number of students that are there. Mm. They're, they're basically buying one subscription from which they are servicing many users behind the scenes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that kind of flies in the face of um, the, the model that we have. In other words, let me draw a parallel. If Concord Green paid for one commercial subscription and had um, one drop and then inside their own facility serviced 260 users, we would only receive the revenue from that one, um, be it relatively higher bandwidth customer, as opposed to 260 customers. I'm using the extreme example, obviously, it's going to be, maybe it's more like 50 or 100 customers. But the, the point I'm trying to get to is, we're, we're, we're allowing them to aggregate their, their service as, as a business, and get a huge discount as a side effect of all that. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that's could be is reasonable and fair, frankly, <laughs> you know, um, uh, just thinking out loud, you know, they're, they represent, um, you know, they really represent a bunch of end users, you know, they happen to live on a campus, they, you know, for, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, you know, I just something I'm thinking about here is it's in it. And this is actually simpler. It's a, frankly, it's a revenue generation opportunity, potentially, yeah. of course, the answer is if we make it any more, you know, we make it difficult, they just go somewhere else. Right. But uh, well, there, there's that. Um, in in these cases, uh, they they are in either the business or the custom service tiers, um, and so the the there's a negotiated service agreement between um, some of these customers and and Concord Light Broadband that that spells out what they you know essentially what they're getting, um, and right, okay. I, I mean, I think that. It, in the terms and conditions, and it's been a while since I read them in detail, but there is, there are some provisions in the standard terms and conditions that where you're not, the the customers not reselling the service to you know to somebody else, but in 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 cases where you're dealing with a business or something, there's an expectation that that business does in fact have employees or customers or whoever it is that they're you know, that they're providing services to. Um, in the case of the private schools, I think that, you know, they, like a lot of schools, have an administrative side and a student side, and they, you know, tend to fence the students into the, the things that they are, you know, supposed to be doing and, and away from the administrative side. And they use some of the Concord Light Broadband services for, you know, for students to have access in, in whatever ways they do. So, but it is, I mean, I think it's useful to understand that a little bit just in terms of the, you know, the complexities and the opportunities that are in the business. 
Um, so what? Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it could be a red, gigantic red herring, but it is a little interesting here to, that we're just, you know, any of these situations where we have, we've talked about this notion of a, 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 a third party that sits between Concord Light mm -hmm. and the end user, that being a homeowners association, a school, and any of those scenarios. But maybe, you know, that's in that situation, we're getting this aggregation effect. Yeah. And I would, would definitely say that there's a room for some policy guidance around the, around the whole question of exactly what businesses, and we've alluded to this before, what businesses and services should Concord Light Broadband be, be offering and, and what basis they are. And, and I, you know, if you ask my opinion, I would definitely say that if, you know, even if a, you know, a residential situation, you know, a rental property or, or condominium came and said, hey, if you meet us at this point, you know, some DMARC right next to the street and drop off a certain amount of, of bandwidth and capacity, and we'll handle it from there, and we're just going to pay you a certain amount every month. I, you know, I think that that's certainly something that that uh, you know the light plant should be empowered to to go ahead and negotiate on. You know, if they think it's it's unfavorable terms, and because you know when you think about it, what they're doing is they're also taking responsibility for dealing with individual customer access issues. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, I'm actually thinking originally way back at the very beginning when I was thinking about Concord Green again, uh, yeah. I actually thought that would be the best way for Concord Green to do it. Just mm -hmm. let's get, you know, 10 gigs to the, a pole at the edge of Concord Green and then let Concord Green manage yeah. the rest of it. So um, uh, we don't need to spend more time on this. This really is off subject relative to our charter. Right. But I did, I did think it was a little bit of interesting and maybe, maybe the part about one thing to put in our toolbox, I guess I would call it is um, if one approach might be that if we're there's this third party homeowner association or whatever it is that's the entity that's between the Concord Light Plant and the end user, one possibility is we have a way to work with them. Light Plant, we recommend that all, the other possibility is Light Plant says, hey, we'll give you an aggregated thing and you can de aggregate it yourself. Yeah. And by the way, take the difference and pay for that de-aggregation, you know? So if you use the example of light plant, 260 people, 20, 20%, that's 50 users, you know, do the math anyway. You get, you understand what I'm trying to get at. It's just, again, a toolbox thing. Let's, let's go on, get to the report. Okay, so what I was starting to think about was how we, achieve um, some completion, you know, or, or how we begin to define what, what, what our deliverable, you know, in time, as we talked about earlier, this meeting is in time for the, the next town meeting. How do we start to look at what are the real requirements around Article 41 and what sorts of things might we want to be reporting and how would we do that? And it seemed to me that, that taking the approach of starting with a bit of, a, of an outline and then maybe that would create some chunks of work that, that, that could be assigned out to folks to, um, to, work, to work on sections. And then we, we need to identify a, uh, you know, how we, get those things complete. And by the way, for, for anybody following along who's not on the board, the this outline that I'm about to, to talk about was attached to the um, agenda information for this meeting and, and so is available on the town website if, you, if you're looking at it. But I'm gonna pull it up on the screen. And I was thinking that we'd probably um, distribute it to, um, to Folks on the um, folks on the task force in in word format, so that so they could get some work. But I, what I'm hoping to do is try and see get some feedback on the idea, um, see whether we're on the right track, and consider whether there are you know additions, deletions, 
modifications and maybe I'll even entertain a bit of a discussion going back to what are the core things that we need to do now and what are the things that we might need to need to talk about um, separately. So or, I, I, I have a, an observation to make and yeah. that is just based on my experience and uh, really uh, you were present at the meeting too. I, I gave a five minute spiel, I think maybe it was mm -hmm. 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, about what we're doing mm -hmm. and the only I cut and and I filled up that time mm -hmm. with with a pretty good summary of all of the things that we've thought about yeah and what I got back from the board was like one comment two comments I got a comment back from the board saying wow that was a lot yeah okay and then and no further questions and then a complaint from a a town resident attendee saying, that's not what the uh, article asked you to do. Yeah. Um, uh, being, meaning that it was too broad. They like, like he the, the, the resident was claiming that we don't have the authority to examine mm -hmm. um, the operations and philosophy of, of the business. Mm -hmm. So I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with anybody any of either of those comments per se i'm just saying it's a useful it's it's a it's an instance of yeah. what happened when we took this to the public mm -hmm. and so here's what i do suggest that we think about not specifically but just in general terms that we need to narrow it down mm -hmm. and uh and and i don't i think we've covered a lot of stuff but like what's the takeaway what do we think uh that this business is this uh, enterprise is doing uh, that, that it, it, what, what do we think it's missing? What, what, what changes and directions need to be done? And, you know, we've always reminded ourselves, I think consistently that we're not trying to actually think like operational yeah. um, people. Um, so, because we, because we're not trying to take their job. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, I think, I think that, I think it's, if, if we took that spiel that I made, which filled 10 minutes and, and uh, filled out a report that actually puts meat behind each and every one of those bullet items, yeah. it could be a pretty long report. It could be at least 20 pages, maybe 50. Oh. <clears throat> Nobody's going to read and it doesn't impel action. Right. So that, that's what I'm thinking. It's like, okay, what, what are we trying to push? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's, you're, you're on a very much what I was trying to do. And it seemed to me that, that by kind of breaking down the problem and saying, what should we write about each of these, these areas? I, I think that the central question we were asked is to really make an assessment about what would it take, you know, what's involved in, in just completing fiber to, to every premise that's that's currently part of the service area as a as a sort of a baseline that that's the fairly narrow reading of it but I think along the way you learn a lot of things and if we come up with some recommendations that say oh by the way these are the things that we learned and we think that it would be a good idea if these other things were looked at in, in some way, that would be a, a useful report. You know, I think primarily back to the light board that who you're representing, Gordon, because that it's the light board at the moment that oversees um, the broadband business. It did occur to me when I was writing some of this up that, you know, I was reminded of some conversations that I had with um, Chris Whalen when he was town manager and I was sort of starting this. And he tended to remind me that at some point the idea had come up before that maybe there should be some sort of citizen advisory board that was either on technology in general or you know specific to to this to, to this particular area. And obviously we have the PEG Access Committee and others, but and I think it's precisely because there are some issues where eventually you know, policy discussions need to be had and, and they don't always and I think if we can even just point to what those policy decisions are going to need to be it could be up to some future board to either empower a subcommittee or 
do something else or you know whatever they need to do to to get those decisions made but it's good i think it's great to have the the artifacts to say you know here's a question you know how how should we you know how should we think about the you know universality of of coverage for example so with that why don't i I'm going to briefly talk about the, I think there's four sections of this seems to be the magic number for things. Um, and so it seemed to me that right along what I was, the, the first, first quite clear objective that we had is to really dig into this question of where, where's the fiber serve and where doesn't it serve and how do we, um, how do we define that? So it seemed to me that it made a lot of sense that one of the major sections would be to just talk about what the existing fiber is, get some definitions and that down about parcels and streets and master addresses, and come up with some categories and some quantities. And I think we spent quite a bit of time in our meetings in October talking about this. I feel like it's it's kind of time to put that on paper and say, if nothing else, here's an here's an accurate overview of what you're talking about if you're saying construct fiber to the rest of the Concord service area. The second section is something that we also familiarize ourselves with in early meetings, which is, you know, what are the business fundamentals? How do we, you know, what are the operating metrics? For example, the take rate, we talked about that at the last meeting and established it probably in the range of 25%. Um, what installation metrics are useful? The backlog, the new subscriptions, how long does it take to, to do that? And what availability metrics might be um, important for the business? Because- hey, Mark, Could you add retention rate to that? Yeah, I think actually that's- uh, uh, that's an, that that is an interesting one. Um, a the 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 um. By the, by the way, Mark. The, the industry um, term uh, for that is called churn. Okay. Mark, um, would it be? Would you entertain the possibility? Since you have, I actually have done this on my site, but it might be even better if you did. If you took the Word version of what you have right now instead of the PDF. Oh, you have the Word up. Yeah, just, I do. You you can just edit it. No. Yeah, that's fine. Great. All right. No, I'm, I was, I'm I did, doing exactly that. Cool. Um, it's because the, the PDF was distributed and that's posted on the website and this will be a product of the future meeting and I'll save it separately. Yeah, uh, I'd, like so, that. I'd like that as an input to the media, minutes if I, if I might. Right. Yeah, churn is, churn is a measure of how many, um, how many subscribers are coming and going every month. And generally speaking, the lower your churn rate, the lower your costs um, because you're, you're not paying to reconnect individuals. Um, okay. So, no, and I think that to some extent, the, you know, these business metrics, while we're not necessarily called upon to analyze the business exactly, um, we do need to ultimately, when one starts to think about a capital project like fiber construction, you need to, you need to ground it in something from a business perspective. So it seemed like there were some section on, on how the business is structured and um, you know, how, what, what metrics it's run against seem to be at least useful for familiarizing with somebody who might be reading this. Um, service growth. Uh, this section would look at how the service has grown so far and answer some of the questions that we touched on a couple of weeks ago, like what do we think the capacity for growth is and what, what might it take to, to realize some of that growth? In other words, are there potential programs or approaches that, that we might recommend? And, and it, when we look at the Article 41 charge, it does actually talk about barriers to growth or you know, why, why don't people subscribe and what programs might be put in place to, to, to do that. Um, so, and then the last area, which, which I think is, is really the, the core thing, which is what, what recommendations would we be 
planning to leave as a result of this. Uh, and it seemed to me that the recommendations might fall into at least these categories, maybe maybe more, maybe less, but you know, policies and actual statement about a recommendation on the universal access question, like is it or is it not a goal to, um, to provide access to the fiber network to every premise in Concord? Um, anything around governance that we, that, you know, is, is there, you know, what, how does it fit into the governance scheme of, of the light plan and are there any policies that should be in place for that? Um, I added this one just because it's as an example, but the support for economic vitality, sustainability and equity and inclusion. In other words, what are the linkages between what the broadband business is doing and other major goals or policies that the, that the town is, is pursuing, um, especially the economic vitality one, I think is strong. And there's a, you know, we, there was some discussion in our charge about, about businesses specifically. Um, and then what processes might there need to be for, you know, strategic planning, for marketing, for business return, there's probably others. Um, what, what would the budgeting process for fiber expansion look like if, if we were proposing to, to, to do it? How, you know, what's the basis for that and, and how might that, that go forward? And again, these are recommendations for those things. Um, a capital planning process, and maybe the capital planning needs to be done, but uh, a process for quantifying the cost of the fiber expansion, uh, a mechanism, what mechanisms could or should be used to pay for that expansion, and what, what mechanisms might be recommended around computing a return on investment for such expansions. Uh, and then lastly, Kind of a catch-all section for anything that 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 we felt that we you know touched on that wasn't in scope for article 41 that it might be needed or anything that article 41 requires on close reading that we for whatever reason felt we didn't weren't able to do in the time frame it seemed to me that at least two of the buckets that that our recommendations might fall into so um Again, you know, my 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 thought on this was put something on paper and then and then talk our way into or out of how to deal with it. I have I have a comment um, because I, uh, not unlike the minutes, haven't had a chance to study this um, before. It much. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, we should do um, what we could do tonight is see if there's anything that's missing that we know of offhand and then if there's sections that we can begin to assign we can do that but maybe reserve the opportunity to update that outline after you know at the next meeting does that seem like a reasonable way to proceed this would also give um gail a chance to review this yeah i i, I mean i absolutely expected that this was going to be something that we were going to you know have probably whatever we end up doing will be you know, barely recognizable compared. <laughs> well, I, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's generally okay. I, I mean, I, I'm generally okay with the with the outline as you have it. And I, I I'm I'm was press. I was trying to look at my notes as you were talking. Keep notes at the same time to see if there was anything that I thought was obviously missing from this list. One thing that. Um, So we we talk about the metrics and so forth, the business fundamentals. Um, where would we put such recommendations as sort of things that are related to, let's say, the growth wheel concept and other recommendations like that? Let me ask it that way, because you so might which, know. Con which concept, Scott? The growth wheel concept, where we go get higher subscriptions amongst the people that are already passed sure. which in turn generates more revenue which in turn allows us to fund yeah. that i think i would probably put that under service growth but 
that's uh, that's it a also question. it also relates to uh, business return. Yeah. Um, like in the utility sector, uh, it's very common. It's almost universal that a a regulated utility um, is allowed a rate of return based on the asset mm -hmm. asset base. And that's actually part of the reason why um, these utilities are actually always trying to find ways to expand their asset base. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not saying that that philosophy necessarily governs the case here. Um, mm -hmm. The light plant does generate a return and it's actually not based on assets. It's based on revenue. But either way, um, growing, you know, if we follow Scott's uh, philosophy regarding the virtuous circle, um, the cycle of growth, or whatever you want to call it, that expands the base. And that should be the basis for generating a larger return to the town. Well, I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's the thing. We either do it that way, or we, you know, authorize a loan and then take more time to pay it or some other hybrid or some combination. And I think we, when we talked about these things more specifically in the past, we, we actually kind of pre-concluded that it might not be that we give a specific recommendation, but these are these are mechanisms by which the policy could be adjusted or the pro the planning could be adjusted mm -hmm. to do this. And then maybe that's a decision that town meeting makes and says, let's authorize another $5 million to do this, you know, pick mm -hmm. a number. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, the way I'm going to approach this for myself is I'm going to go back and collect my notes of other things I'd like to see in the report. I did, I actually made a draft of the outline some time ago and I can't lay my hands on it. And then I'll see what, if I can find a home for them in this outline. And then if I can, then we're good to go. Otherwise I might make a recommendation, but that's where I'm, that's where anybody, I'm going. Anybody else have an initial reaction they want to Voices. Well, I, I'm, I can only come in based on my memory of all the meetings, and I think it's, it's, you know, I'm not nearly as knowledgeable as you other three. I think it's incredibly thorough, Mark. Um, from what I remember in in the meetings, and thank you for it. Okay. Good. I, I think that that also my sense of the work of the committee has been that, that, that we've generally been. Um, very productive. Uh, the conversations have been productive. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of general agreement. So that should make it easier to, to um, generate a report. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe we should concentrate on that. There may be some areas where actually at sort of the higher level philosophy, uh, there are some differences. And um, I don't know if we want to um, worry about that or maybe put that front and center. I'm not sure. Uh, in a way, I kind of want to keep the good feelings going. I really feel like as if in so many instances, anytime a particular question was raised, we really come together on it and, and come up with some great suggestions and, and, um, and, and, and a pretty decent idea of the way forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think it's, to some extent, I think there's something to be said for putting forward a straw man on, on almost any one of these questions and then kind of looking at it from a pros and cons perspective. And I, I, I feel like everyone has demonstrated a lot of flexibility and willingness to, to, um, to consider alternative views on each of these topics. And, and I think that makes it the best. And I think that I'm well aware of the fact that that those of us that are here are here because we're interested in this topic. And that almost in and of itself makes us not representative of, of the broader town. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> so we need to be <laughs> we need to be careful about assuming that just because you know we're we're in violent agreement that somehow that that's well, I mean, actually where the town wants to land as opposed to saying we recommend that you know through some process this sort of policy get adopted the purpose for the policy is x and you know our our view is that maybe do it this way but you know figure out a way to 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 to, to answer that one statement um the central one i i believe is is around this 
this capital planning for for fiber system expansion and and I think there are several options that we've put on the table before. Um, in that case, I think it's so central to this work that we should probably enumerate kind of what they are, um, and then critique which one we we think is 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 most likely to you know is is, is at least more most attractive to us and you know maybe if i had to you know i'm i'm just gonna not because this is the right place but you know there's a status quo thing which is you know continue to operate the network that we have right that's then then there's there's the ex, expand to fill existing voids option and there there may be multiple ones of those and then there's uh you know some some version of of you know grow the, the business towards some objective that is you know maybe beyond what's been done to date uh, i'm just again you know top of my head but you know those are at least three versions of of what does it mean to expand the fiber network and then one could look at okay well does how long do we have to do that and how much money and and you know what are the available options for that and you know one could spend quite a, kind of a lot of time on that just one that that, that yeah. simple topic but and and, and the, the the impression that i I have, or the the sense that I have, is is that as you go further down that scale, yeah. becoming more and more aggressive, that's where um, uh, risks actually start to increase too. No doubt. Yeah. Right. But it might be interesting, and I guess I'm I'm a little, you know, in Scott's camp, and I was thinking about ways that we could, you know, get a little bit of a multiplication of effort, but maybe we could do things like assign a person or maybe a pair of people to at least put put pen to paper and say if i were writing on this subject you know on behalf of the uh, of the committee with an idea of a uh, of coming up with a recommendation you know here's a straw man for what that recommendation could look like and here are the pros and cons of it so that we could then Get ourselves into a mode of reviewing that, and then you know, decide having a proposal to either adopt or reject or modify, rather than you know. I, again, I'm just trying to begin to move us in the direction of completion of 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 completing something. Yeah, I I'm just to jump a little on on this thinking about this, and given where my interest lies, I would like to volunteer for the section two the business fundamentals because i'm the one that built the financial model and I'm, yeah. i have an interest in that and i'd be happy to take that outline work on it and come back to this team and and have you guys tell me what to add or cut um, the other one that i guess the probably the key you know as earlier tonight we talked about this as a three three-step process which i was very happy about which is the um where 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 are the problems what will it cost to fix them and then how do we fund them right that's kind of the fundamental thing that we're going to want to ha address in this uh, in our report right and maybe that's actually what should be those three items in the most concise word economic way should be at the head of the you know in the executive summary where are the problems well we've identified 56 locations where there are one or more residents that can't be reached because of fiber, what will it cost to reach them? It varies from two thousand to ten thousand dollars per residence. How might we fund that? Blah blah blah. You know, if it's boiled down to something as succinct and other recommendations could follow after that. Oh, by the way, as we went through this process, here are some things we observe. I I, I would think that would be the way to put the front end on this thing, and, mm -hmm. and that's just thinking out loud. So, uh, and one of the problems being uh, perhaps whether or not 
all the populations, all the constituencies are being served, right? Um, yeah, and I call them problem. gaps in service or, you know, let's, it's, yeah, yes, it's, it's a problem, but, you know, in, at some level, I think everybody agrees that it's less, I, I don't, I, I guess I find it a little bit of a more neutral term to say here are the served or unserved areas rather than, rather than saying, you know, these are problems exactly. I mean, they, they are okay. some. I was just borrowing uh, Scott's yeah. language. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, task or assignment or challenge or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and what what were the three steps you said, Scott? Like identify the problem. Do, yeah. Do, so I so I, I'm actually step. writing notes here. So the first thing was served and unserved areas, and and maybe one of the sub bullets there would be what penetration we have in the served area, because I think that's a kind of important point. You know, we yeah. say we have so many houses that are already served passing cable, and we have a roughly twenty percent penetration rate or something like mm -hmm. that. And then there what there are these unserved areas, that and that's really goes to the crux of the article request you know question the second one would be what is our rough order estimate of how what it would take to solve that problem and we might even use the example of concord green because they've been focused on it and they've come up with a number and i think the number is somewhere around 200 grand for their 260 users to give them access and then the third part is how the, how might that be funded so what's the problem how much would it cost to solve it or address it and how might we fund it? I, I find that a useful construct. I think it, it, it is um, it, to, to be able to first quantify, you know, what are the areas that we consider to be unserved? In other words, in, in our current, you know, market, uh, recognizing that there's, there could be a world in which that market changes somehow, but I think it's 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 good to start with a fact set. And so um, that was why I started with section one, even though it's not the most interesting one. And of course, there'd be an executive summary that you know kind of points people to what we found at the end. But I don't know that we really, until we engage in this process of kind of delineating all these things and, and wrestling with them a little bit, I I don't know exactly. Where we're, going, where we're going to come. I don't feel like I know where we're going to come down. Uh, uh, I think we don't know how much it's going to cost yet. I mean, yeah. we still haven't gotten to that point, but I um, think we we're, we have a potential for making a um, an educated guess, I guess is the best. Yeah. Uh, swag. I'm, I'm not just going to use word it. swag, you know, which is, you know, scientific wild uh, guess. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, okay, go ahead. I, I, I'm I, just I, saying that, you know, we could start this outline with that and we, and, and maybe as we start our outline, item two, which is the how much would it cost to solve these problems, we might be starting with a very wide range because, and, and oh, by the way, that range might be narrowed if you figure out that you can do something like a ditch switch to draw optical cable inexpensively, or we can route the, the optical cable through some town land that isn't the street right away or some other things like that that would just be sub bullets to that that say okay these are things that might mitigate that cost and then the third part is how do we fund it and that's a much more business calculation you know that so, and that'll that'll come down to loans increasing revenue blah 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 so it, it and you could an analysis like that could come out could then be used to arrive at a takeaway or or advice, which is, um, look, you guys have uh, a ins installation crew this size. You're capable of doing um, 30 installations a month, supposedly. Uh, you know, here's what we recommend: you need you need to in increase the size of the pool because if you don't. It's going to take 20 years for you to accomplish this other thing. So it's sort of like, yeah, um, I mean, I, I mean, I think it could actually, into, yeah, it yeah. could actually be less prescriptive and just say, you know, if you install at 20, you know, if you install at the current rate, it'll take you 20 years to pay for this. If you up that rate to 40 or 50, then it'll take you 10 years. And we can do it in that way. So it's like, it's, you know, let them make the choice. And, you know, frankly, I, one one would hope that it becomes fairly obvious that maybe they should increase the rate of installations. I also had another thought, which is the 
the, the, the three points we talked about, how we address them, I think there's two things that should follow it. One is specific recommendations or recommendations that are really to the subject of what we just discussed. And then I'm, I, I think there's another point that we should put down at, uh, there, which I call ancillary recommendations, which are a place for us to articulate some of the observations that we've made that are not directly tied to the article, but because of our discussions, these are recommendations that you know that we kind of came out of this. And this is this again. I I'm kind of talking about this as part of the uh, executive summary here, and then and then these yeah. set things that Mark have put together support all this. I'm just trying to. So let, let me just try to re restate what I said a second ago because um, I, I I think it got lost. Sorry. But let me let me say it a different way. In a way, the crew that we have right now is. What's the word for it? Um, dead. It's de uh, dead cost. Is that sunk cost. Sunk cost. Yeah. And and if if and and so what, the only reason that our recommendations would make any difference is if they um, moved them off of that um, default course. So we we need to say whether or not what they're doing right now is is going to get us to the end point put another way look back to the sunk cost it's like they've already committed to hire these people they have these people they're in the process of training them they brought brought some more people on board they're, they're they are aware of the urgency of trying to increase the the rate at which things are um, installations occur why is that not good enough right we we if it's not good enough and we need to decide whether or not it is not um, then we need to explain why, and and from their flow, um, actions. The actions are to either increase or decrease the staff, I think, and maybe also address or re reevaluate priorities. Yeah, I, and I don't know that our recommendation should be anything more specific than to say to increase the rate of installs or increase the. You know, let me ask a question: Should we just say increase the number of paying subscribers, which can be don't lose old subscribers or install more new ones. And should we further make the recommendation that, gee, you should hire more people and buy more trucks? Or the alternative is maybe you should hire contractors and do it as a contractor or some hybrid thereof. Is that part of our scope to do that question? Oh, sure. And in fact, they, they have, um, the staff has said that they, are in the process of hiring subcontractors, but now that it's winter, I'm not sure that that plan is current. Well, I mean, this, to be honest with you, this is something I've been thinking about. What did we say from November or December to April? They can't do many installs. Yeah. So I can't, Im I can't imagine where it makes sense to grow the permanent staff that would have to sit on their hands from December to April in order to do installs as opposed to hiring contractors and and uh, you know so that's a separate discussion and i don't know if that's a recommendation it's a contractors little bit like uh, tree work so yeah yeah i mean that, what, useful but planning yeah. is also important and you know there's a there's a lot of businesses where you use you know some off-season period which boils down to three or four months for either training planning or or other kinds of upgrades yeah, I mean, end. yeah, I mean, let's that's a little bit of a, a red herring at this point. Let's go back to the discussion about the outline. I think we're in agreement here mm -hmm. um, as to the format and mostly the content. Are we not? Yeah, what I'm what I'm concerned about is I haven't seen the case made or I'm, I'm just not sure that what the OK, I can nitpick about the priorities that the light plant has uh, chosen. Um, but I understand why they chose them, and I agreed to it at the time as being a, a light board member. Um, so uh, move me off my rock, right? Tell me, tell me why it is that uh, you know a, a prioritization where you have a, a certain number of staff and you're going to install them um, as the calls come in, prioritizing the ones that are uh, least expensive and quickest and easiest to do. That's the basic current philosophy. Yep. And is there a problem with that? 
I, I, I mean, I, uh, Gordon, I think you guys don't, ha you haven't, from what I've observed, and it's a limited observation, you haven't had the data to make those decisions properly. In other words, so you may have made decisions about priority as a light board member without a complete picture of what's going on. That's I understand. Like, I'm not trying to defend every every. No, um, I, I just thing I don't like I that. don't I don't think the light board, as of the time that we started this endeavor, understood the financial the model the operation and the cost and the, the dynamics of of the broadband business. The other um, thing I can't defend is uh, the shutdown of of uh, installations during COVID. I mean, I, there, that's the there's a reason for it. Quote COVID. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's that great an excuse. I don't know. I don't really understand it. Um, maybe people yeah. didn't want to ask for the service because they were afraid of yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I, I actually don't know that that's something that we need to get down that path on. I, yeah, I had shared a, I had shared a file with Mark that I, well, never mind. Go ahead. Let's, the observation let's... I would make though is that you know if we look at other examples around policy in, in town, you know, let's take things like the sustainability goals or the, the you know, the drive towards greenhouse gas reductions or, and, and those sorts of things. Those have, have resulted in actions and, and plans by various staff across multiple department, across multiple town departments based on a fairly clear set of goals that have been articulated by citizens who, who go and sit on things like the Energy Futures Task Force, you know, that outlined what's the conquered goal for 2030 in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, and then everybody was asked to, to do that. And I'm raising that because that's part of the governance DNA that this community really has. And I think that this is an area the broadband area is an area where the as citizens we haven't necessarily taken taken the time to say you know is there an is there an actual goal obviously there's an enterprise there's a business that we could be running and we could be running it to try to make money or something something like that but we don't you know buy renewable energy credits as part of our electric bills because we're trying to run a business in the most optimal profit-seeking way that businesses are often run. We're doing it because there's a policy and an objective that's been set, set out by the town that says, you know, do something about the, about the upcoming climate crisis. And, you know, I would submit, and the reason I put in the, these, these several areas that I put under number, you know, A3 here is that if we wanted, you know, a vital, economic town center, there, there's something to be said for having a policy that says, even if it's not going to pay back all that soon or that well, it's a really good idea for us to be trying to make sure that our small businesses or our, our, our enterprises that are operating in the business areas in town have access to that fiber network if, if that's something that will help them. And there's there's, I think that it should be understood by the by the broadband team that they should go out of their way to do that um, mm -hmm. as well as institutions around town and i think the universal access question is the same sort of question it says you know how far we could it's you know anybody can decide to go after the those those premises where it's easy to make money the question is how far down the road towards the ones where it's not so easy um, do, do you go and, and what are the criteria that, that staff should be using to do that? And once those are clearly understood and surfaced and become part of the, the ongoing dialogue, that's when you get, you know, air source heat pump rebate programs. And, and David mentioned something this week. There's a, what was it, some kind of raffle Yep. Or that you know they're they're giving away seventy five dollars for anybody who schedules and and or a chance to win a gift certificate or something for anybody who schedules an, a chance to drive an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you could you could put a hundred dollar gift certificate on you know anybody who signs up for broadband in the next next year. If it would cost next to nothing, it would pay back. And you know the only reason it's not being done is because that the impetus isn't there to to market the service for any grant any grand you know reason and so that's why i think it i think it behooves us to at least point to the fact that these you know these positions haven't been taken and maybe even recommend some positions that we think are reasonable to take yeah so like in the in the environmental sphere uh the uh the argument was made that all of the efforts that concord has done to create um to, to install solar mm -hmm. don't count yeah. because uh because of rex right and that instead of building solar we should have bought rex and i'm sorry but i'm just gonna have, go ahead and say it there's no way the town meeting would have uh pushed through um an expensive uh ambitious measure at the concord middle school uh if it involved buying rex instead of putting solar panels on the roof yeah. anyway that's a Picayune policy issue mm -hmm. uh, that does have some, and, and you can tell I kind of have some strong feelings about it, but um, uh, it's, I, I'm not, I, I don't really mean to bring that into the argument, but the, the point is, is, is that sometimes these, these high level theoretical philosophical movements, they mm -hmm. ebb and flow. Yeah. And, you know, I take the Concord has embraced sustainability um, principles that says that we can't use mined materials. Yeah. It actually says that. Yeah. And it's like, that's not how our economy runs. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> I, I, I aspire to buy an EV and that's going to have a ton of lithium in it. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm, maybe I'm being a little bit, and I'm sorry, this wasn't that helpful a, a com comment, except to say that these things are very difficult to deal with at the at the philosophical level. And mm -hmm. I think that as a community, we kind of, it's like a river ebbing, ebbing and flowing around the rocks and we're generally trying to get mm -hmm. into a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And so how that, how that applies here, it's like, okay, well, some of the rocks are that, uh, you know, not everybody that wants um, Concord Broadband can get it. Yeah. And so we, I think it'd be great if we could tackle that, get, get an idea of what, why, you know, explain why that is and maybe give some ideas of, of how to improve it. Um, hmm. and, and also how to grow the business so that, so that we, it'll throw off um, more revenue that can be used to increase the footprint, you know, provide it to more people um, and also provide a good return to the town. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's definitely one of those things that belongs at the near the top of the recommendations or the ancillary recommendations. One of those two, it should be front and center somehow. Yeah. To, to just play back, what what specifically were you saying should be front and center, Scott? The notion that the flywheel concept, which is if we yeah. can include this, improve the subscription rate amongst those that are already passed. Yeah. Then that it create. And it really goes to the third bullet point. How do you pay for it? We can pay for it by taking out a loan, whip out your credit card, write a check, or increase the revenue to the business. And and, and finding ways to uh, increase the rate of, of uh, new installations with the people we've got um, is kind of like found money, right? Because we've already committed to spend that money. So, um, uh, well, yeah, and, and it may be contractors fall into that category. So you use your your staff basically to steer the contractors. And it's a force multiplier. I don't mm -hmm. know, um, but what I like about focusing on that, Scott, is is that it's relatively um, uh, concrete. I just have anyway. I just anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we we may have some other more concrete ones wrapped around the multi-tenant thing, and um, you know that I think that hopefully those will be part yeah. of this recommendation as well. Well, multi-tenant is so difficult. I, I just I don't know how we're going to solve that without basically giving money away. 
Well, I, I do think there is, um, it may be, you know, let's, let's dive into that for just a minute. It may be that we offer a couple solutions. One is, and I still have to do this, is the sort of analysis for concrete green. What if, um, as a result of the survey, and David would be interested to know what it came out at, but let's say for conversation's sake, 20% of the people of the 260 locations inside Concord Green said they were interested in it. So we're talking 52. What do those numbers look like? And I owe that to this committee. So I, I will do that. I've been gathering up some data to do that. But the Scott second one, the second one. I'm, did, did you get the results, Scott? The results of what? The survey. Did you mail them out? Oh, uh, I no. I, you, you. I, the, I gave it the last meeting. Um, round numbers: thirty percent uh, in favor, seventy percent opposed. Okay. And what? Did, just out of curiosity, what does that mean? Um, if if the thirty percent was enough to pay for it, would the seventy percent go along, or what? Does it? Is it just flat out dead? Uh, it's the, the position the board took is that at this point in time, we were not expend. Well, let me, let me just kind of detail it. Our guesstimate was a hundred thousand um, dollars. And that was put into the survey. It was a one question survey with a lot of detail uh, about what, what CMLP offered, what your switching costs may be to, um, to, um, what the CMLP costs were, plus if you wanted to add other services. And then <clears throat> we um, said it would cost about $100,000 $100, to do the work at Concord Green. And then it was a yes or no, would you be in favor of the board spending that money? And then it was a yes or no question. However, since then, since we're involved in a second project, which is paving of the complex, we have learned that the cost of laying conduit um, for our paving project, and that conduit is for EV um, charging in the carports, the cost of laying conduit is set, is on average seventy five dollars a foot. Yeah. So for our, power, that's a very different thing than a fiber cable, but that's that's it's key. Four, it's, it's four inches conduit. Yeah, but it's buried how deep? Uh, well, this is uh, the conduit <clears throat> that we would run for um, some of the uh, broadband would run under road, so we'd have to bury at the same depth. At any rate, on average, seventy-five dollars a foot. So our hundred thousand get uh, number for the CML portion was actually a bit too low. That, yeah, so I think you, you did that, mention 200 at one of our previous meetings. No, I didn't, uh, but the, go ahead. Summer. Okay. Well, anyway, um, that's fine. I, I was more interested in the 30, 70 part of it. Yeah. Um, if, by the way, would it, is it possible for you to share with us the survey, on, uh, just a blank survey? Uh, I think I sent it to Mark, but I'll send it back out short sure, to the whole group. Sure. Yeah. Just... just Yep. One of the other things I'm gathering up is um, one of our public commenters from last time mentioned that they spent $300 a month on Comcast. I'm going to ask him to share the bill so I can understand what the yeah, I'll, I'll it's going. When, <laughs> I, when I went to try to actually see the survey, I was told that the document was no longer there. So I never actually saw the question. Oh, you couldn't see it, Marcus, the way it was linked, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll get it for you guys. So it'd be, be interesting to see that. Or um, have to attach it to the minutes. Yeah, if we or if it's distributed, we could look it over at a at a future meeting too. Sure. It, so since none of us have actually seen it, um, it, but it's an interesting way. I mean, it, well, for one thing, it's just a interesting data point for what happens when you you know sort of ask people about whether you know the investments that they you know can and should make. Um, and it did occur to me, just going back to sort of the core thing that we're looking at, which is what's missing in here. Um, and Gail's reminded us a number of times, I, and I, I had the thought when I wasn't in front of my computer, uh, sources of funding like the, um, you know, 
recovery grants and things like that. So, you know, what programs are available that might, and it goes to Scott's question of how do you pay for it, but, you know, recognizing that there may be some external sources of funds that, that you know, could help mitigate some of these, some of these installation things or, or address certain specific projects that might be done. I, by the way, on that front, um, one of the links that was shared, and I, I don't know if Carlin shared it or whoever, was on this, some broadband development funds. And one of the things was part of that, following down the paths, uh, was actually a link of uh, funds that were actually had been distributed. And the numbers were nowhere near enough to actually deploy a broadband, but they were in the, it's my, I was struck that many of them were in the fifty to $150,000 range. They weren't multiple millions of dollars, but they were at least in that range. So that might be something we could use to apply for those outliers that need it, you know. I think I saw that Sudbury got 80,000. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, there there might be cases, you know, specific. So one of the things that I continue to point out is that we, you know, when we looked at our gaps, there are 50 different places around town that have, that are not served for one reason or another. And some of those places might uniquely qualify for something, you know, and it, and it may be that a few thousand dollars helps. I, you know, if I think about the, um, what's the, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the facility, but the one over on the, near the Hunt Gym. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lower low-income yeah. senior living facility maybe i mean it might not be a lot of money but if you can get fifteen thousand dollars to you know put some conduit in or dig that just because of the group that's that's there um you know that's one less project that needs to be done yeah so okay. maybe it's like a piecemeal solution by the way uh mark pamela dritt has her hand yeah. oh yeah thing. okay um if it, and we are getting close to eight o'clock so um Pamela, if you have a comment, that, that would be appropriate now. And then I think we'll, we'll maybe talk about a few tasks and, and wrap up. I'm especially sensitive that you people are hanging in, you know, virtually on the eve of a holiday. So I don't want to overstay my welcome. Thanks, Pamela. How are you? Good. Thank you. Pamela Dritt, 13 Concord Green. Um, I didn't realize the survey was going on, so I didn't get to fill it out, but it was a one question survey and it simply asked if we wanted the board to spend $100,000 at a minimum to put conduit in. It did not ask any questions about whether or not we wanted broadband. It did not ask any questions as to what we were doing for broadband access, whether we had it or not, whether we, what our, what our, um, current providers were, how much we were spending on our current providers, or any of those questions that I think it would be really useful to have as data. Um, it's okay. sort of, it, it came out a little bit like a push poll. Okay. Make sure that we don't have to spend a bunch of money. Anytime you have a one question poll, which is how much money do you wanna spend on something? pretty much everybody says, we don't want to spend money on that. Although there was a lot of nice, uh, a few nice links to CMLP, uh, uh, the website, and to links to Hulu and YouTube as uh, places you could go to look at other providers. I just don't think that the poll gave us enough information to assess the interest in having broadband, fiber broadband in Concord Green. Thank you for that. Um, Carlin, did you have a comment? Very quickly, I uh, heard rec a recommendation about using an executive summary, and I think that's a really good idea at the front of the document. Um, you're supposed to be making a report to town meeting. You might consider publishing that one or two page executive summary as your submission to annual town meeting and as a deadline, the deadline for materials to at annual town meeting is April 19. So if you want to get an executive summary 
as part of the meeting materials, maybe with some key highlights some key recommendations. April 19 is your target date and make sure you coordinate with Carmen, the town moderator, so she knows that it's coming and that'll give, that'll give her a heads up. That's it. Yeah. Thanks, Carla. Oh, oh, one more thing, Gordon. Sure. Yes, I will read the entire report, whether it's 20 pages or 50 pages long. So at least mm -hmm. one person will read it. And I'm hoping that you post it on your web page so that other people will have a chance to read it too. Thanks. That's it. Yeah. And I think that our report falls into the category of, you know, how the, it, at most major meetings, there's a motion right at the beginning that does is so common that it doesn't even get covered where you weave the you waive the reading of all reports i think we're we're in that category i do not expect that that what we're what we're about is likely to get published in town meeting materials especially since we're i think we're we're quite certain that at least for this town meeting um we're not even going to rec we're certainly not recommending anything that town meeting needs to take action on so um, what we're doing is we're taking to heart the, the, the charges um, direction Actually, that, that we prepare a, a report in time for town meeting. Yeah, um, I mean, we can repair, prepare the report for town uh, in time for town meeting and have an yeah. executive summary that we submit exactly. materials. I would actually suggest we should explore the possibility of presenting something on the order of, I will call it three to five slides during town meeting to inform people of our work. Mm -hmm. uh, just to, we don't yeah. have to decide at this time. I just, that's something I'm putting in your head to think having, about. Having me. worked with, with a lot of moderators over the years, I, I, I haven't met one yet who takes anything but a dim view of presentations that aren't leading towards actually acting on some well, particular well, that, article or motion. Well, but, part of that, all right, well, we'll come back to that when we decide yeah, what we're gonna we wanna will. recommend, because it may be that we're gonna, rec I'm just gonna say we may recommend that this work needs to continue beyond April. So just hold that and thought until we get a little further into it. Listen, if there's anything that's actionable, it in a way, I think we kind of captured it in an exchange between Scott and me, okay? Yeah. Where speaking for the board, Perhaps I shouldn't have speak, spoken that way, but speaking for the status quo, I said, look, there is a prioritiz prioritization scheme that's in place and, we're, and, and they're installing at a particular rate and that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Why is that not the right approach? Right. And that in, in, in essence, I think that's what the report, if it's gonna say anything, if it's gonna re recommend change to the town meeting, it's gonna have to be why that doesn't work. And there's a lot of reasons why it does work, okay? Because it's budgeted and actually talk about proof of, of, of existence. A lot of towns wouldn't have been willing to take the risk that we took by rolling out this service. Yeah. And they wouldn't have known that before they tried it, whether or not it was actually gonna work. It did work. So that's it, it mm -hmm. worked. So what's your complaint? So it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a incremental change kind of argument that, that we need to come out with. And, you know, one of the things I point to for why change is needed is the underserved, the underserved populations. And if you, if you go back to the uh, um, light board presentations that we, that I heard, it was like, yeah, we know that we're not serving um, a Concord Green and these others. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. And so, you know, we've kind of written them out of, out of, out of the status quo. So, you know, and I, so Scott, don't take me from as just defending the, the status quo, but I'm trying to define what this report needs to do in order to be actionable and useful and, and to, um, you know, pro provoke uh, meaningful. Yeah, no, I mean, change. you know, I mean, one thing I'll just comment on Gordon, it was by design from the beginning, as I've articulated when we went through the business model, that this was a slow growth model because we knew damn well, if you tried to go fast, then you'd have to authorize way more money. And so that's, yeah. that's, that is the truth and that is the status quo. And that was the model we presented and that was the business plan we presented. And so that's, that's all fine. The whole purpose of this activity from my understanding is we're, we're you know, this is mid game, right? We're, we're N number of years into this maybe there's a new approach now that we, you know, the, the status quo may, may or may not be still acceptable at this point or, or reasonable 
I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm, neither of those things. That's a not not a good word. The status quo may not be applicable anymore because now we have more revenue. Theoretically, we've retired debt. Theoretically, I'm saying that theoretically because I'm still trying to understand some of that in light of the 1.9 million dollar additional loan we took. Um, but in theory, we should be in a position where we could make investments where yeah. we weren't we weren't there when we started this because we didn't want to take that risk we didn't want to get that far out on the limb and discover that we couldn't do it what yeah. scott's alluding to is that there are there are considerable quite a few options i think that are well short of anything that would require town meeting action that could adjust the pace at which the fiber network was getting expanded um, and a lot of those i think are are very much within the purview of the, the light board to work with, you know, CMLP staff specifically on how, on what sorts of budgets they build and what kinds of programs they build into those budgets when they're doing it. And, and I think the key to that is gaining an understanding of how much room is there in those budgets for, you know, for let's call it, you know, discretionary levels of expense that are, um, that, that might be directed in one way or the other. So I'm going to take one more comment from Pamela, and then I want to do a little housekeeping before we wrap up. So um, Pamela, did you, did you want to say something else? Uh, I wanted to uh, re-mention something that I know David has said before about Concord Green, which is that the repaving of the road, which is happening imminently, is a major expense barrier to serving fiber to Concord Green, unless there's some way that we don't do it underground because it has to go under the road. And if we don't find a way of doing that now, it, I don't think it would be financially feasible at any time in the future. Mm -hmm. And that I feel would be tragic to not be able to do that kind of investment, even if it isn't, to every building. And even if, like, like I'd be pay, willing to pay thousands of uh, dollars to get access to it. Yeah. Um, but, but most people wouldn't. But, but we won't have that chance unless something is done before the paving. Uh, and so, uh, and it would need to be the light plant or some kind of thinking outside the box option that needs to be done now and can't wait till town meeting. Yeah. For all of us. Thanks for that comment. Okay, um, so Scott had volunteered to potentially work on the business fundamentals portion and kind of give us, you know, hang some more meat on that and maybe rework it a little bit and, and, and come up with something. Uh, I would be willing to work on the exist, existing fibers and unserved areas. I feel like that's a, that's a fact set that I've looked at quite a bit and, you know, potentially write that section as, as something that gets, gets dropped in just so that people can get a genuine understanding of the, of the, um, case on the ground. Is there anything else that that anybody particularly wants to wants to volunteer to work on right now um, in this document? So we can kind of assign out some sections and then maybe come back with some re read back. I'm I'm willing to take any particular section. I I I don't really have a strong preference. I, either do I, but I'll if I could look at it in the next 40, 48 to seventy two hours, okay. it'd be fun. Yeah, so I'll just say that I'll flesh out some more of that. If Scott can work on those, that, that'll give us more than enough to, especially in conjunction with some discussion that I'm anticipating we might want to have about the status of the broadband budget. We'll, and we'll talk in more detail about the work plan um, for, for you know, bringing this. And really, I, my objective right here is to just sort of bring the whole thing into a little bit more fo focus so that we can understand where we're kind of headed and, and decide you know, who else do we need to talk to? You know, when do we need to talk with the light board or, or anybody else that, that, that might be out there about, 
about sort of where we think we're going with this. Okay. Okay. Any uh, final I, comments or questions from anyone? I'll, I'll take I'll take a look at the service growth. Great. I'll do the sec so that's section three. And you know the thing I'm interested in that is is that this is the part of the report that where we generate some potentially generate some urgency. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's start with that. That's section three. Right. Yeah. And then um, I think Mark is one, me is two. Is that right? Yeah, we'll, we'll start with that. Um, there's no reason why, you know, just someone can't make any suggestion that they want to about any given one, but I feel like figured that this is a way that we can at least yeah. work the document a little bit and um, and try and, and begin to see where we land when we start to make affirmative statements. And, you know, if there's alternative statements that want, we might want to do, but I'm hoping that what this is going to do is lead us to some conversations where we say, I've looked at this particular topic. I think we can either say this about it or that about it or the other thing and reach a consensus on, you know, what position we're going to take and then, and then try to get that on paper. Sounds okay. good. Well, with that, I'm going to wish all of you a happy, safe holiday. If you're traveling, be careful. And, and um, if you're not traveling, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> really? I went through middle of Concord today and this afternoon, and it took me forever. <laughs> okay. Really? Yeah, yeah and, the traffic uh, was terrible. <laughs> um, uh, I move that we close the meeting. Thank Second. you, Scott. Thank you, David. Um, if there's no further discussion, I'll take a roll call vote. Um, I can do it. For Gordon. Aye. Scott? Aye. David? Aye. And myself? Aye. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Take care. Meetings adjourned. And by the way, minutes are coming out in a few minutes. Okay. Oh. Great. Thank you. Yay. Bye.